Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we are here for the Maintain Rights series. My name is Anna Pernas. I'm the Director of Conservation and Education for the Preservation Resource Center. Before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping notes. Um, the PRC is proud to present the Maintain Rights series to be a resource for homeowners to empower them with the knowledge they need to spot potential problems in their historic houses and find ways to address them, including who to call when the problem requires a professional. With the generous support from the Louisiana State Historic Preservation Office and the Joanna Favreau Fund for Historic Preservation of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Maintain Right will be launching a website, free classes, short videos through our social media and YouTube. You can catch up with a few of our summer classes on our YouTube page. Um, Ms. Claudette has been with us. This is her second time. And um, tonight we'll be talking about storm preparation. Uh, I also wanna say thank you to all of the members and donors of the PRC who make our work to preserve New Orleans historic architecture, neighborhoods, and cultural identity possible. We are a 501c3 nonprofit and rely on the support of members and donors to do the work to protect the authenticity of our historic city. Your donations and fund PRC's innovative revival grants program, which makes free historic repa home repairs for low-income families in Tremaine neighborhood. Um, if you are not already a member, please consider joining us. Um, as hurricane season has already started, we believe it is important for your home to be resilient it allows you to quickly return to the safe and healthy property at a minimal expense of after a storm or flood. Um, Dr. Claudette will be talking about top 10 way um, home improvements that can work to uh, make your home more resilient. Uh, Dr. Claudette Hanks Reichel is a professional extension housing specialist at the Louisiana State University Ag Center. She serves as director of the La House Resource Center, a demonstration house exhibiting multiple high-performance housing solutions and a hub of extension education programs to advance resource efficient, durable, and healthy housing for the Southern climate and natural hazards. Uh, Dr. Reichel has developed numerous education outreach programs and resources relating to housing, including energy efficiency, healthy homes, hurricane and flood resilience, and others. She has authored more than 100 extension extension publications, presented at numerous professional events, and was twice featured speaker at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C., and has received 12 national and state level awards for program um, excellence and impact. So I want to thank you tonight for joining us and presenting again for our Maintain Right series. Finally, uh, just want to let you the, the viewers know that we can see, we you can't see us. Sorry, I'm mixing that up. You can see us, but we can't see you. So please make sure to submit your questions through the, the discussion via the Q&A chat or chat functions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, I will be monitoring the questions and we will get a chance to relay them at the end of the discussion. So thank you again for participating and thank you again, Dr. Claudette for joining us. I'm gonna hand it off to you to share your screen and begin your presentation. Okay. Uh, oops, wait, I messed up. Let's see, I gotta do screen two and then share then do this and from beginning. Okay, yep. did you see it? Sound looks good, <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, come on, come on, Orleans people. Um, delighted to have you all here and, and, and I'm, I'm pleased to have been asked to present today to talk about protecting their wonderful historic homes um, and maybe some ways that you haven't considered or thought about before. What, what I'm going to offer are basically the top 10 wind and flood resilient home improvements. Because, um, you know, your house being historic means it's been there a long time. It survived a lot of natural hazards. But, um, but a home uh, damaged by a storm or flood is suddenly just not a safe place to live in. But a resilient home can offer you even more. It can, it can improve your property value and make it to where you can come back much sooner and much less expensively. So I'm going to share with you the top five wind and the top five flood improvements to make your home more resilient. You know, resilience is that key goal, and, and that's the ability to bounce back quickly after a destructive event. 
resilient housing. We talk, we use that term, you know, about communities, about planning, about everything. But in terms of housing, by that I mean homes that can be very quickly restored at very minimal expense to a functional, healthy, and comfortable home following a natural hazard, because that's what every occupant wants. Resilient housing saves you. It saves your families from long-term you know, displacement or even homelessness from the financial ruin that can occur. Uh, and of course, not to minimize the ordeal, the stress, the turmoil that you go through in that process. And of course, the health hazards that can result from it. But it also saves businesses from the loss of workers and productivity and, and loss of, of profits so that they can survive. And of course, it reduces the public cost. You know, what we pay as taxpayers for all this disaster assistance that keeps going out to everyone. Now, you all are aware, well aware of what happened in 2005. You know, these storms taught us some very hard lessons. And you all experienced the images that you see here. You know, the impact upon our one state was just so immense, but it's the impact on families that I feel was just profound beyond words. You just think about the, the work, the time, the cost, the toll, and, the, and probably many of you experience that. Plus, money is just too little and too slow to come in to help you with that process. And that's a huge impediment to recovery, which you well know. So to create a healthy and resilient home, you know, we know that, that climate matters, conditions, but the hazards matter, and they matter a lot. But that is just part of it. It's crucial to keep in mind that a house is not just a box, it's not just a building, it's a system, a very dynamic interacting system, just like the human body. But you know, many of the, the building professionals we hire, and of course, you know, consumers too, they, they don't really understand that. And that can lead to some mistakes and some very costly problems and some failures in this. So um, you know, it may seem hopeless sometimes, but today I'm gonna to try to help a little bit. And we're gonna start off with going over just a little bit of, of some basic building science relating to moisture, relating to H2O or, or moisture dynamics, because that is, you know, that and wind are these focal issues for resilience and for durability with both kinds of natural hazards and with just the rainy season that we're having right now. We all you know, understand liquid water and it tends to flow down with, with gravity, um, except when it doesn't. And you know, that kind of happens a lot because wind can blow water in any direction, you know, up into soffit vents. And then most building materials wick just like a sponge where water will travel vertically upward and horizontal, horizontally through concrete, through wood, through brick, all of those materials are basically prettier hard sponges. And then hydrostatic pressure pushes moisture from that's in the soil into these materials where it can then wick. So that's important to understand in terms of wetting, but also in being able to dry. So, you know, your homes were built to, and they got wet forever. And, and it's okay to get wet. And your homes are testament to that. It's okay to get wet if they can dry soon enough before they create damage. So the real key in, in anything that you do to resist damage is to try to you know, minimize the wetting as much as you can, but without preventing drying. <clears throat> you do not want to waterproof in a way that will prevent the drying capacity of your walls and your other materials and assemblies. Now, we tend to forget about water vapor. You know, we kind of see and understand liquid water most of the time, but water is also in a gas form because, um, and, and, and it's there, it's there all the time and it's real and it flows two ways, with air movement and by diffusion through materials. 
This is the little piece of physics that if you remember this, it's going to help you prevent problems in terms of normal conditions, but it's also going to help you with the drying process when things do get wet. It's really important. So listen, moisture flows from warm to cold and from more to less. And this is so important to remember that I'm gonna say it again. Moisture flows from warm to cold and from more to less. It's trying to equalize. Nature always wants us to try and balance and equalize. The same thing applies to heat and applies to airflow, but right now we're talking mostly about moisture. So in our homes, which way does it flow? Where well, it kind of depends on the climate, on the conditions, you know, on, on the weather. So when it's cold outside, there's not much moisture in the air and we're heating our homes, you know, one of the systems we have, so it's nice and warm inside, the moisture that's inside that we generate by cooking and bathing and breathing and so forth, it wants to go outward. It's trying to get out of the building through the materials. But most of the year, this is what we deal with, right? We have a hot, humid climate and we air condition. So that makes it cool and dry on the inside. So most of the year, basically whenever you're air conditioning, moisture, there's a strong drive pushing moisture into the building materials and your building. That's important to remember. So first let's talk about floods. You know, flood disasters are really common um, around the entire nation. Only the, the, you know, in this map, only what you see in brown has never had a declared flood. But we, you look at Louisiana, we are big time flood zone. And so there is something, you know, the flood um, code or, or our building codes dealing with flood are really just based on the National Flood Insurance Program, a government program and its standards and its underwriting guidelines. It's not really based on the same level of risk that we use for wind and, and for fire and for everything else. So these these, this means that, that um, in these guidelines and, and these programs, anything that is below that base flood elevation indicated on a map, which is so many feet above sea level, must be made of a flood resistant material. And any foundations, you know, below that point um, are required to have flood vents to be able to get flood insurance. And the vents have to be within a foot of the ground so that it will allow flood water to flow in and out and prevent collapse of, of the foundation. And so, of course, it's always best to elevate above the potential flood level. And traditional New Orleans architecture did that, but then we've closed in these bottom levels, these floodable levels, and, and made them homes and apartments. So now they are at risk as well. So you have to have flood insurance if you have a mortgage and you should have it whether you have a mortgage or not and for the lowest flood insurance premiums you want to have everything except stairs and access and storage at two to three feet above the bfe you'll have the lowest premiums at three feet above the base flood elevation and it provides a little bit of a cushion of safety but not a whole lot because like i said that bfe I, I hate that term 100 year flood risk because it really gives a false sense of security. And I think you all you know, know this by now. What it really means is a 1% probability of flooding above that level in any one year, not in forever. So that translates actually, if you look at this, to a very high likelihood of flooding over the life of the house. So our building standards and our BFEs you know, are based upon that. So if you have a hundred year old house and it and the floor is at the BFE, you have a hundred percent chance of flooding above that level. That is a very, very weak and risky level of protection. And then the BFE also assumes the levees won't fail. Ha! Throw the dice and hope you win again because this is what happened the last time we counted on um, the levees never failing. And though, yes, they have been fixed, they're much stronger now than they were in, in 2005, um, they're just reinforced to a Cat 3 storm. What if we have a four or five? It could happen again. 
And then really in other parts of the state too, as well as in your area in 2016, my arid state had, had our biggest disaster ever, you know, with heavy rainfall, it wasn't even a hurricane. Um, and 70% of the homes did not, were not in a flood zone. They weren't even below that BFE. The next year, Houston had major, major flooding, hundreds of thousands of homes, 75% of them were not in a flood zone. Um, you're kind of getting a message here about, you know, the adequacy of that level of protection, the BFE. And in New Orleans, it's actually kind of artificially low. It's usually set about three feet above the street, regardless of how deep the water is going to be if the levees fail. So yes, it's always best to elevate, but we're talking about your current existing homes right now. And it may not be possible to elevate. It usually isn't, you know, with existing homes. I mean, it can be done, but it's very expensive. So for everyone else, if you can't elevate above the possible flood level, I ask you to consider something that FEMA calls wet flood proofing, but nobody knows what that means. So I tend to, I have a new made up term. I tend to call it flood hardy because that's more understandable, but it means the same thing. So we have plugged this idea, this concept since the 80s, is the big floods we had then. And it's essentially build or modify your home to be drainable, washable, and dryable, you know. And, and, but this process is now made easier by modern materials that are available. And what's so great about it, it's not an all or nothing. Like you elevate, either you have to do it, all the way above a possible flood level or it does you no good. But with this, do whatever you can afford and you'll have less damage than before you did it. So I'm going to talk about the five things that, five categories of things that you can do and any of them you can do helps reduce your cost, reduce your ordeal, reduce your, your, your time before you can get back home. First of all, Elevate the expensive appliances and utilities that you can, particularly your air conditioner, compressor, your water heater, you know, consider uh, front load washer and dryer, you know, it's on pedestals if you can. There are a variety of things that you can do. And if you're doing any renovations where you're dealing with wiring or you're doing a restoration, place them higher. It's also better for universal design, which is, you know, designing for all ages and stages of life, just in case you ever have someone in the home that, that gets around in a wheelchair. So part of that, um, the number two um, strategy is to use flood hardy materials as much as possible. And FEMA has these technical bulletins. Um, they're kind of old, they're, they're reworking it into ANSI standards, but I don't think they're quite ready yet. So this you can find online. And um, this shows where I have the circles, you know, the acceptable products for flood. And you can see solid lumber, which your homes are made of real wood, solid wood, rather than, um, rather than oriented strand board and particle board and so forth. That, that survives floods, along with, um, you know, metals and ceramic tiles and things like that. In terms of insulation, that's often one of the most vulnerable materials that we have in, in some of our homes. And the only insulation that is really a, a flood hardy material is closed cell plastic foams, both the rigid and the spray foams that are closed cell, not the open cell. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So if you're going to do anything structural, choose um, flood hardy structural materials, concrete, solid lumber, and believe it or not, plywood, um, CDX plywood tends to hold up. It, it tends to be very resilient. It'll take in some water. It may swell some, but it's gonna go back and retain its strength, but not oriented strand board, not OSB. So stick with those three materials for anything that you do. Floorings is a biggie. If you're choosing or replacing floorings, consider the flood hardy types of materials. Of course, you know, if you want a decorative concrete floor, you know, that's, you don't need to do anything to it forever, but just about. But, but ceramic and porcelain tile um, that, that's uh, well adhered, solid vinyl tiles, um, with a waterproof adhesive, but even better than that, now you can get these solid vinyl um, interlocking tiles. 
and they go together like a jigsaw puzzle. They have little, you know, male and female parts underneath that you can't see. And they come in various colors and patterns. And so if you ever flood, they're not glued down. They're heavy, they're a quarter inch thick. If you ever have a flood, you can pick them all up, let your subfloor dry, and then put them back and not have to throw anything away or replace them. Solid hardwood flooring that many of you I'm sure have can sometimes be restored, but you need to have it installed in a way that it's easy to, remo to remove um, either the whole thing or some of the planks when the flood is coming along the way. Otherwise it will buckle as, as I'm sure many of you know. Wall finishes on the interior. Um, if, if the potential flood level is just to say three feet or below, consider using uh, wainscoting. It can be solid wood or plywood or, or fiber cement and, and make it removable. Many of you have the real plaster and, and one of the great things about it is that it is pretty resilient um, to, to having been underwater, to having been flooded. The problem generally with it is how many layers of paint do you have on it, which might make it to where it can't dry. But, but real plaster is pretty resilient. Even better is paperless drywall. Um, sheet rock is really a, a brand name term, but, but it's gypsum drywall. And the normal drywall has paper facing on both sides. That is not flood hardy and it's mold food and it's termite food. But they make a paperless drywall with a fiberglass matting instead of paper. And that is a FEMA approved flood damage resistant material. Um, they also make the, the gypsum core more moisture resistant. So it survives beautifully after a flood. Um, yes, it costs a little more, but it can survive. On the exterior side, brick, solid wood, um, drainable stucco systems that are done properly, and I don't have time to go into the details. Fiber cement is very flood resilient. And then some of the new composites that have um, uh, resins and, and waxes in them and borate treatment are very resistant both to, to, to um, to flood damage as well as to decay and termites. As far as raised floors, many of you have raised homes, raised floor systems, and you, you know, many of you probably have no insulation underneath, and that's fine. You know, it, it can be safest to leave it that way. But if you do have insulation on the floor and or you want it, this shows the two options that are flood hardy either using a rigid closed cell foam panels under the entire subfloor joist taped and sealed airtight, or the closed cell spray just sprayed two inches thick or more between the joist up against the subfloor. If you have a subfloor and you don't wanna do that if you just have your wood flooring right on the joist because the, the foam will you know, seep through the cracks. And that's, that's not a good thing. These same two flood hardy subfloor insulation systems are also the only two subfloor insulation systems that we recommend in our climate and a flood zone. You know, in a hot, humid climate, outside of a disaster, the number one um, inquiry that I get is cupped wood flooring and subfloor rot. And it's because our raised floors rot and cup in the summer because of the moisture dynamics that I told you about. So when you have cool air conditioning and the cooler you like to set your thermostat, the worse the problem. And then you add a floor finish that moisture cannot get through, which would be polyurethane on your wood or laminate flooring or vinyl flooring. It's like a vapor barrier. And then that's even worsened by having a, a a fibrous insulation underneath that lets the moisture get to the subfloor and keeps the subfloor from ever warming up, you know, by the outside warm air. So it, it gets colder and colder all summer. And then you get not only this strong vapor drive trying to come in, but you get condensation on that subfloor because our, 
our dew point outside is way higher than the air conditioner setting we have inside. So the floor gets wetter and wetter all summer. So that is a recipe, cold air conditioning, impermeable floor finish, and, and fibrous insulation is an actual recipe that adds up to wet subfloors, cupped wood flooring, mold and decay fungi underneath because they're attracted to that and the termites are attracted to it also. Bad, 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 bad. That's why those two systems work well. Number three thing to do for flood hardy is to, now this is a bigger one, but it's something to consider if you're doing some of the other flood um, hardy materials that I talked about, is consider the possibility of, of your subfloor system and, and your walls that are within the potential flood level to form washable, drainable, dryable walls. So you don't have to replace stuff, but you can still clean it and dry it. The removable wainscoting concept is a great way to do that. You can remove it and then clean and then put it back. Or the paperless drywall. If you leave gaps between the panels, then moisture won't wick from one to the next. Um, or, and um, combining that with pop-off or easy to remove <clears throat> trim like baseboards and crown moldings or, or chair rails. Then in the wall, if you have any insulation at all, it be a closed cell insulation, either rigid foam sheathing on the exterior side or between the studs or cut to fit there or closed cell spray foam partial fill. Do not fill the entire wall cavity, only maybe 50, 60% of it because you want that, that space to be able to wash it and drain it. And so that way, after a flood, you can flush it out with a detergent solution, do a sanitizing rinse, let it drain, get your dehumidifiers and speed up the drying process so that you can get things dry enough to not form mold. Um, on the exterior side, fiber cement, vinyl siding or brick veneer um, that is installed with a gap uh, so that they can drain as well. So that's the washable, drainable, dryable walls. These are section drawings for those of you who are familiar with those that shows the concept in more of a new construction way. But if you are um, going to do something, it's, it's the same kind of concept with just the rigid closed cell foam insulation, um, either on the exterior or a partial fill inside the wall. Then after flood, you remove the trim, wash it out, let it drain, and then put it back and not have to really gut and replace everything. Number four home improvement for flood hardy um, and or flood resistance or flood damage control or reduction is to think about mold, you know, and what's mold resistant. So choose mold resistant materials, but also mold resistant improvements. In order for walls to be able to dry, they need to be able to dry toward the interior when you air condition. That means no vinyl wallpaper ever in our climate. Paperless wallboard, like I talked about before, is, has no food for mold, so it will be more resistant. But of course, your, your, um, your uh, traditional plaster is also pretty mold resistant if it doesn't have too much paint on it. The best kind of paint to use on our interior surface is acrylic latex paint. And if you want to go that extra step of mold resistant, get one with a fungicide in it. And then any materials that um, are, are, are wood materials and insulations that you can get that can be infused with borates. Borates or borate spray application whenever after flood, if you have walls open. That's an opportunity to get the added benefit of decay and termite resistance. And you all in New Orleans are the hotbed of the Formosan subterranean termite, which is extremely destructive very quickly. Um, mold resistant improvements include solid smooth floorings with no paper backings. And then um, if you can insulate your windows and doors so that they don't sweat in the winter time on the inside, or on the outside in the summertime, that can reduce moisture problems and, and reduce the mold that may result from that as well. 
five, number five, is that whenever you're doing any kind of flood hardy restoration or any renovation in your older homes, you really need to be aware of the lead paint hazard. Um, you need to assume that it contains lead paint. The older the home, the more likely it is to have lead paint. And any exposure is harmful to everyone, but especially to children. But even if you have no children, most people don't know, if you have high blood pressure, it can worsen that. So it's a hazard for everyone. So if you hire anyone to do some work on your home, Hire only people that have an EPA lead safe certified um, certification or firms that are lead safe certified. You can look them up on the epa.gov website uh, forward slash lead to find firms that are certified. We provide the training here, so it's readily available. So you don't have to accept someone who doesn't have that certification. It's a one day training. They can do it and it makes, um, that teaches them lead safe practices. So just for you to have a little bit of familiarity, you know, whenever any work is going to be done, you need to be sure that people and kids are kept away and protected. Workers should wear, you know, proper protective gear and they shouldn't take it home. And to prevent lead paint hazard, particularly if you're doing any projects yourself, what you want to do is avoid creating dust whenever you are having to remove or disturb paint or to pull anything off that's painted. It's the dust that gets airborne and, and creates the hazard. So wet methods are the best. Wet things and then scrape. Don't sand, don't, um, don't torch and don't use the chemical to try and remove paint. Um, afterwards, cleanup is very important, but not by you know, brushing things around with a broom. It really should, again, be wet methods and damp mop, or better yet, is if you have a HEPA, H-E-P-A vacuum cleaner that can capture the very, very fine particles. And then just make maintenance easy. You know, the windows, with the friction that they create are really the greatest risk for lead. And so anything you can do to have smooth wash washable finishes and to help educate other people can help prevent this very, very serious but preventable poisoning that, that many people can have. Those are the five basic home improvement categories for flood damage resistance. Now let's talk about hurricanes, because you know, you know, it's not just us, it's, it's half the nation, but we really, you know, have that in a big way. Um, these are, what you see here, these are the major hurricane damages um, in order of magnitude of insurance loss claims by the property insurance industry. So top of the list you see are roof type damages, then come window and door failures, and then water leakage points. So that kind of sets the priority for any investments that you make to improve the hurricane and, and wind damage resistance and resilience of your home. So number one home improvement is to improve your roofing. Make it more wind resistant. If it's not time to re-roof your home, if you have conventional uh, shingles on your home, there are things you can do to reduce um, damage to them, you know, to help reinforce them. And very inexpensively, you can get a do-it-yourselfer or, or your handyman to get roofing cement and to re-adhere any loose shingles and particularly those along the edges, the edges of your overhang, the edges of the rake of your roof. Um, three tabs of this roofing cement under each shingle tab and then press it down can, can really make a difference and very inexpensively. But when it is time to re-roof, when your roof is, is getting kind of worn out or it has damage, um, if the roofing is removed, take this opportunity to reinforce that roof decking so it doesn't fly off in a really strong, strong wind with something called ring shank nails. They have these little ridges, almost like screws, but it's a little different and they don't pull out. And so they are much, very inexpensive, 
uh, thing to do, but can really keep that roof decking on your, um, on your rafters. Never let them use staples to, to secure your roof decking or the boards, like if you have decking boards, same thing. Ring shank nails can help to reinforce. Then add, consider adding a secondary water barrier and upgrade the underlayment from what you had before. A secondary water barrier is something where if you lose some shingles, you get, it, it provides protection so you don't get a lot of water seepage through your roof decking. And that can prevent a great deal of water damage. So two, two good ways to do that. One is to get a roofing approved tape and to just, they can tape the seams of the roof decking first and then go over it with a synthetic underlayment instead of the typical you know, type of felt. The synthetic underlayments are available by all the roofing um, shingle companies now and they're extremely tear resistant. They do cost a little bit more, but boy, are they worth it. So go with the synthetic underlayment. And then uh, an alternative to that, instead of the taping and the synthetic underlayment, if you wanna take it even a step further, particularly if you have tile roofing um, or, that, or you're going to go with tile or slate roofing, is to upgrade to an adhesive membrane underlayment. It sticks, it seals around penetrations, and it lasts a really long time. For a leak resistant roof, which is what everybody wants, you know, upgrade the flashing. The flashing is what protects potential leakage points and connections between materials. So we really um, think it, it's a great improvement to have a peel and stick membrane in all the roof valleys. And you can have the other type of flashing on top for, you know, for the looks as well and to help um, as like, you know, belt and suspenders. But if you have a roofing or a part of your roof that meets a vertical wall, like if you have dormers or, or a split level, that is a very risky point. And, and it, you need to be sure that that is properly detailed and it rarely is in our part of the, of the country in Louisiana. We highly recommend something called step flashing, which is not usually done, but it's much, much better and so it's worth the extra. They do it other places of the country, but you know, unfortunately not here. This turn back flashing that they use not only is not good enough for our level of rain and water, but it also tends to create a little bubble out and that is a wind catcher. So that makes your roof even more vulnerable. Kick out flashings are what just keep it from you know, draining down the wall and making it unsightly. So that is commonly done. But the drip edge, that drip edge around the edge of your roof, in the past, we would put it under the underlayment because you want it, you know, you, you would think you want it shingle fashion, but in a high wind area, which you are in, there's a different new recommendation now. It should go on top of your, your underlayment, on top of your roofing felt or synthetic underlayment to help hold it down if you lose some shingles. So for high wind, put it on top. And then you can tape over it if you want to. So improve roofing when you re-roof. Um, create a secondary, you know, reinforce your deck and secondary moisture barrier. And then, of course, the final thing, the shingles, if you have shingles. Now you can get high wind and hail rated shingles. They look like other architectural shingles, but they are not the same. Do not confuse a long warranty roof, like a 40 year roof with a wind rated roof, not the same thing. A 40 year roof just means it's gonna hold up to sun longer than others to the effect of UV rays. It has nothing to do with wind resistance. What you need to look for are these ASTM ratings, but basically a class H or a class F roof Class H is what's best. It is actually tested, a standardized test to about 150 mile per hour. And so that is going to be your most hurricane resistant roof 
Um, and then if you want hail resistance, look for class four. That's the best hail resistant rating. And you may be able to get discounts on your insurance for having these. But you can buy a class H roof, but if it's not installed right, guess what? It's not gonna perform. So you really have to enforce that your contractor reads the, the manufacturer's instructions for high wind and follows them. It will usually involve six nails per shingle in very specific locations and, and a specialized starter strip that goes with it. And you can't just take a first set of shingles and turn it upside down or trim them like they used to do in the past. That starter strip has adhesive on the edge that will hold down the most vulnerable first course of shingles. So that is very important to enforce. And I highly recommend hand nailing them in and not using a um, hydraulic nail gun because the pressure sometimes can overdrive the nails. And ask me how I know this, okay? Yes, I was a victim of that practice and I had a class H roof that failed because they had, they used nail guns and over, and, and, and they were driven in too much. And because it was a faulty installation, my insurance wouldn't cover it. So learn from my mistake. Um, two, secure your soffit and attic vents. Most of you have some kind of attic vent and some kind of soffit vent. And what's typical, and you probably saw this after Katrina, you know, they typically fail. So all of the ones we tend to have that you see on the left in red tend to be very vulnerable to hurricanes. There are better options. There are wind tested ridge vents and, and your soffit vents should be structured and they should be fastened. And then another option is that if someone does have an unvented attic system, you know, with insulation under the roof deck, spray foam under the roof deck, um, and, and none on the floor and a sealed system, then there are no ridge and soffit vents. So that's kind of a side benefit. However, it's usually not practical and not recommended to convert an existing older attic to an unvented attic because it just takes too much to get it to get it right. It can be done, but that's that's for another um, another time to talk about. The um, if you have the kind of soffit vents that are just like resting in a J channel, just kind of loosey goosey sitting in there, then you can keep them if you secure them. So use a polyurethane sealant and caulk those joints and install stainless steel screws through them and through that that J channel and into the framing to help hold them securely into place. Um, Better yet is to use structural soffit materials like perforated fiber cement soffits and then fasten it to framing at least every 12 inches. Plywood can work too. Here's um, what to look for in terms of ridge vents. If you install ridge vents with a new roof, get the wind tested ridge vents. This is done by Florida because guess what? they have the same issue and the same problem only through a much higher population area. And so look for the wind tested TAS 100A um, ridge fence if you're going to install new ones. Number three, this is a very simple thing. Try to reduce the water leakage of wind driven rain by sealing cracks and gaps with caulk. Um, any hole that's in the exterior wall, sealing it can help reduce that. And that's an inexpensive do-it-yourself. But you know, the real weak link in many of our homes are that our, our major openings, our windows and doors have either no flashing or it's incorrectly installed and not integrated with the house wrap or, or building paper, or whatever weather resistant barrier there may be. I know for some of your homes, you don't have any of that but some of them do. But whether or not you do, it's hard to go back and add, you know, this flashing system and make, make it done right without just undoing everything. But what you can do is make sure that you've got drip cap flashing to kind of kick the water out so it doesn't run down your windows and cause decay problems and leakage as well. So you see on the left, the traditional wood window head jam flashing, 
Um, but if you can't get replacements for that or you don't have that, you can get metal drip cap flashing and just have it worked in under that bottom lap of your siding and if you have building paper behind that too. If you are going to do anything where you get to install new windows and doors or you're doing replacements, ensure that they are properly flash where everything, think of being a, a drop of water and it's gonna run down and is everything shingle fashioned all around that window or door. Make sure there's protection of the window sills and the corners that's often missing. And then the place to really air seal and to prevent wind driven rain from coming underneath is on the interior side. So that gap between the window unit and the framing should be sealed with a low expansion foam. Number four improvement for wind is to secure your surroundings. And again, this is um, you know, almost a no brainer, but something that we sometimes neglect. If you have very fine gravel, that can be caught up by a very strong wind and become little missiles to break things. And that happens even more so with tall buildings. So replace gravel with very soft mulch or very large, heavy gravel that, that won't become windborne. Of course, trim your tree branches, remove any dying trees, and then plan for or find a place to store um, any objects that are in the yard so they don't become flying debris as well. Five, now this is a more expensive option, but something especially to consider in New Orleans because you are in a windborne debris wind zone. And, and that is to consider um, investing in convenient impact shutters instead of having to go fight, find and store and cut and fit and install heavy plywood right before the storm. That is a huge ordeal and they always run out of materials and then where are you gonna store it afterwards? But you know, the impact shutters, people think it's to keep from having a broken window. It's not, it's not about saving the window. It's about saving the structure because if, if debris, if flying debris in, in a hurricane breaks a window, you know, if, if, it, if it penetrates a wall, you get a little hole, you know, the size of whatever that flying debris was. But what happens if something this big breaks a window? Do you have a hole like this? No, all the glass falls out. Big hole, big hole. And when you get a big hole, you can get the wind coming in and it can greatly amplified the uplift pressures on the roof and put pressures in the house that compound the exterior pressures of the wind, the positive and negatives that are happening on opposite sides. So that is the reason in windborne debris, uh, high wind zones that, I mean, that is the reason that high wind zones require, and we recommend, you know, a new construction required, but we recommend uh, some kind of windborne debris protection of glass, um, whether it's a, a window or door. It's to protect the house, not just to keep from having a broken window. There are so many options on the market at different price points, and you can get the very attractive Bahama shutters or the side hinge um, colonial or board and batten shutters but they're not the same as the traditional operable shutters. They are wind tested by a standardized test and they generally have metal components. So they're pretty, they're functional, um, but they are expensive. So there are some less expensive options such as accordion shutters, which are also very convenient, but they're not pretty to put them on back windows. Um, there are the roll up screens. Um, you can see that, that picture that says transparent, those are impact rated screens when properly secured with the proper hardware, the top and the bottom, they can protect the entire porch and all your windows and doors on the porch. We have an example of that at the house. And then another really good option are the lightweight corrugated panels, either aluminum or what I really like, or the translucent ones. And you, you pre-install tracks, and then before the storm, you just pop open the track, stick them on, screw on some wing nuts, and they're done. And they're super lightweight, and they store very compactly. 
So those are, are, they cost more than plywood, but they're so much easier to install and more convenient. So they're a great um, removable storm panel option. The bottom right picture, you see a garage door. If you have, you're in, the, you know, you probably don't in a historical home, but anyone who has an operable garage door, that is the most vulnerable opening in the house because they're not really secured. So wind, um, high design pressure rated ones are really a good investment in a place like New Orleans. If you're going to do any kind of rebuilding or major renovation, or you're looking at buying a new home, look for those with a hip roof and a moderate slope. They are inherently aerodynamic and more wind resistant just because of their shape. But they also tend to kick out and shed water away from the walls. So the walls, the windows, the doors, everything will last longer. And they provide some shade to, you know, which is help reduce your cooling bills. Uh, homes that have continuous structural sheathing all around will help resist the racking as well. When rebuilding, renovating, or buying, um, look for homes that have uh, hurricane connection hardware to, to provide what's called a continuous load path that connects all the different pieces together from roof to foundation so that nothing will push it off the foundation or make it lean and rack or pull it up off, off of the, the foundation. Now, most of this is, is practical just in new construction or if you've gutted your home after a flood, you can put it on the interior side. But that bottom middle picture shows a retrofit opportunity with existing homes where you just remove the very bottom a piece of clapboard or, or shiplap and temporarily, and you can install some metal connectors that tie the stud to the bottom plate. And, um, and then that helps to hold things together. And you can do the same at the very top and then put those, um, those siding pieces back. Uh, if you're um, replacing windows or you're adding storm windows, you can add start there are storm windows that can be added on the outside or on the interior side. So you maintain the historical um, nature of your home. Uh, storm windows, you know, may be hard to find those that are impact rated, but the, you can at least find some perhaps that have a high design pressure rating so they don't fly off. Uh, from suction in a, in a wind event, and always choose Energy Star. Now look on the right. Um, if you're needing to replace a window and, it need, and you want them to be 100% wood framing to, to fit that historical look, there is such thing as treated all wood windows that are also Energy Star, so they're very energy efficient, give you greater comfort, but the treatment makes all that wood termite and decay resistant. Um, I haven't found them impact rated, but you should be able to get a higher design pressure rating than, um, than you may have already. So uh, this is um, a picture of our La House Home and Landscape Resource Center at the LSU campus in Baton Rouge. And we are now back open to the public. You don't need an appointment to drop in Monday through Friday, 10 to 4.30. And um, we have many things to see, not just for new construction, but a lot of retrofitable opportunities, um, examples of, of solutions as well for our climate, for our conditions, as well as for a healthy home. Our website, just Google La House Resource Center, or you can type in that URL you see at the bottom, lsuagcenter.com forward slash La House, and there you will get to our website. You can click on My House, My Home, and there's tons and tons of articles on different topics, but, but with today's topic, I, I really want to point out what's in the red circle. There's an icon there on the homepage called Flood Recovery. You click on Flood Recovery, and you get here. So here is where some of our main pieces of information are on the left is storm damage cleanup highlights. It's, it's a little piece that you can download as a PDF or you can order as a print publication. Um, it has how to clean up after storm damage um, in, a, in a safe way. 
Uh, wet flood proofing, that's the other term for flood hardy. That is about the things that I talked about today. You can get that piece. Um, the disaster information rising by the flood, that is a lot of different, our disaster series of a lot of information. Some of them are a little older, but there's still a lot of valid information there. And then what I most wanna point out on the right is FAQs after getting your flooded home. If you have flooded, you could probably will flood again at some point. And, and after that, there's just lots of, of questions. And I did this after the 2016 flood. So it's kind of, you know, aimed more at um, slab on grade homes with brick veneer, but not strictly. I'm not going to go over everything in it, but to just kind of give you a taste of what's there. You know, there, there's 26 FAQs, questions and answers. Um, and, and the beginning ones apply to everyone. You know, they're about lead safety, how to clean and speed dry, the moisture content you want to have before you restore, you know, and dispelling some of the myths and the misinformation that's out there, and on and on and on. Then it does get to some restoration method options. And they are flood hardy options. So the first one is a rain screen with closed cell spray foam on top because it provides the, the drainage plane, it, it, it gets structural capacity to replace any damaged sheathing and it's insulation and air seal. So it has a lot of advantages, but it is kind of a pricey thing to do. And then the other is to use a different method to do that with where you need less spray foam. But I recognize that in historical homes, there's often a restriction that anything you do to it must be reversible. So there are ways to make spray foam reversible, but it's generally not a first choice option for many people. So that's where the rigid um, <clears throat> extruded polystyrene foam board inserts can come in. Um, these foam board insert method um, is a do-it-yourself possibility, you know, and it uses off-the-shelf material. So you don't need, you know, a spray foam applicator to do that. However, it's very labor-intensive and very time-consuming with a lot of detail work because you have to measure and cut every, you know, piece of foam to fit the stud cavity of every, every cavity. So it, it does take some time. Um, however, that rigid foam can serve as your, your weather resistive barrier, your drainage plane, you know, it provides some insulating value. And when you caulk it, it seals airtight. So that's energy saving, but it doesn't provide protection to the back of your studs. So that may still be an issue. And it doesn't have any structural capacity. So you may need um, something else to provide that if, if you lost some sheathing. Um, and, you know, you may need two layers of it to get to an acceptable, um, the, the level of insulation that you want while still remaining flood hardy. Here is an example of how this was done in a New Orleans home that flooded um, and was damaged after Hurricane Katrina. And those of you saw my last presentation, you saw this same slide. So this is kind of a demo project of taking an historical New Orleans home and making and you know, making it greener, you know, more energy efficient and moisture resistant. So it started. You see, it's got the um, the clapboards right on on the the wood framing without any sheathing. So it started by adding this drainage mat material first to maintain that drainability of water that gets behind the siding. Then the rigid foam board. So it creates that gap, provides for the drainage. And then the rigid foam board cut to fit, to fit was placed. Now, many of your homes, the New Orleans style homes are balloon frames. So they don't even have a bottom plate. They were designed for air to flow up through the walls to help cooling. But now that we air condition, that's a detriment rather than a help. So that does need to be blocked, you know, to create, um, to seal up that gap. And then the foam should be to the outside of it. So again, the drainage is shingle fashion. Then you can fill, um, put more insulation in that space, either with another piece of rigid foam board or some closed cell spray foam, but don't fill it entirely like I talked about before. So this is one way if you're having to gut after a flood that you can restore for much higher energy efficiency, but still be flood hardy. 
Um, the FAQs also get into some other insulation alternatives and provide some information about that as well and answers some misconceptions. Um, no foam doesn't cause moisture problems and mold. You know, don't walls need to breathe? Yeah, that, I hate that term, that's not right. Air leaks are not a good thing. Walls don't need to breathe air. What they need is to allow moisture that gets in them to dry. So what we need is for the interior side to be water vapor permeable. Gypsum drywall or plaster and just latex paint. No oil-based paint, no vinyl wallpaper so that walls can dry to the inside. We have a little publication called Improve Your Home and Prosper, um, which you can get from the website as well, download it. And we have some hard copies here at La House, uh, print copies. And it's about those energy saving and hazard resistant home improvements. But another great resource is HUD's uh, Rebuild Healthy Home. This is, um, it was updated in 2015 and for addressing damages from all types of disasters, floods, hurricanes, and more, you know, including, you know, earthquakes, wildfire, and everything. But it's written for homeowners and for volunteers um, on, on what to do in a question and answer format. And it also has a section at the back about restore for more than before. In other words, to make your home more resilient, more energy efficient while you're doing it. This is as a free online PDF, but it's a very comprehensive, it's, it's a big manual. Um, but it's also a free mobile app that you can download from the app store of either type of phone. So be sure to, to check into that if you're ever needing to restore some damage. A really great resource online is disastersafety.org. That is a property insurance, you know, research and, and um, entity. And they are the ones that produce the fortified home programs. And they have one for existing homes. And the fact sheet, it's a third party certification, but you don't have to do certification. You can get their, their information and their guidelines and their fact sheets for free off of their website. So check that out and use it. Flash.org is another great resource for how to um, strengthen and, and protect your home. Um, they're both in Florida, so they're both tailored to our conditions and our climate that we share with Florida. For your contractors and the professionals, and if you want to take it a little bit further, the Building America Solutions Center originally was a Department of Energy, you know, collection of great user-friendly information on energy efficiency and building science, but now they have added resilience and they have quite a good bit of, of good information there. So it's a credible science-based resource um, of how to do things for energy and resilience. And then, you know, one of my go-to favorites is buildingscience.com. That's a site of building science and, and Jeff Steebrook, who's a very famous building scientist who actually has come down and done a lot of work um, after our events uh, here in Louisiana. And he gets the hot, humid climate. So I'd encourage you. And he's also, you know, quite entertaining to read. Um, he's he's a, a, a very um, a humorous writer as well. But the real point of my presentation today is this message. I think any of you who have been through Katrina and Rita know that as we shape our homes, we truly are shaping our future. So I encourage you to consider some of these top 10 um, home improvements to protect your home, but also to make your life and your home more resilient. Thanks so much for being here today. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. I think that was extremely helpful. And I really appreciate you including all those references at the end for people to get a little bit more information on the different topics that you hit on and, and get some of those questions answered. So thank you for putting this all together tonight. Um, we do have a couple questions here that I've kind of put together. Um, some of them, I've got a couple on the shutters that you had mentioned. Um, I think at one point you had, you kind of used the term as, what do you mean by convenient regarding the shutters? 
Well, the thing is, is that um, what a lot of people do is they, before a storm, they feel they have to board up their windows. And that is not convenient, you know, to have to go right. buy plywood, cut it to fit, you know, drill into it. And even if they have it pre-cut, where do you store it? And it's heavy. And so it's not something someone like me could do on my own. <laughs> And all the people who would help me are all busy doing their home. So that is not a convenient option. So of course, the, the, the greater the convenience, the higher the cost, you know, like the operable, wind tested, wind rated, um, impact rated, uh, you know, shutters and, and Bahama shutters and things like that. Um, the, the accordion ones are very convenient but way more convenient than boarding up with plywood or oriented strand board, heavy panels, are those removable corrugated lightweight panels where you just pre-install the tracks at the bottom and at the top. And then you still have to do something before the storm other than close them. You still have to install them, but it's just little wing nuts. And then what's great about the translucent ones is they let light through. So right. when they're up, you're not living in a cave. You know, you can actually get some daylight because, you know, you lose power. And, and so I think that that is just a, you know, a wonderful option. The, the fabric screens <clears throat> as well. We exhibit them on the front porch of a house. We have a gallery with arches and we have the fabric screens. So the hardware is pre-installed, but the, the impact rated screening, you can take it down outside of hurricane season. Mm -hmm. Or you can leave it up and draw them like, open them like draperies and just let them dangle on the side and then close them when the storm is coming. That's way more convenient. And there, there's another type I showed in the picture that you roll it up and roll it down. So it's got this big cornice and, and so the, the impact screening is in it and you just roll it down or roll it up kind of like, um, you know, kind of like some of the interior window treatments that we have. So get as much convenience as you can afford, um, particularly if your home is elevated, you know, and, and your second story or your high windows, because that is really trying to board those up on, on a ladder is, you know, not only hard, but dangerous. Right, and I think in New Orleans, especially we're so used to like the wood louver shutters or the wood paneled shutters, and we have a video actually being released just to talk about the maintenance of those to make sure that they are storm ready. I think a lot of people right. aren't as used to going in, closing them, making sure the hardware is exactly. even functioning or the lock is correctly in place. So now making that, sure that those. Another thing, about a lot of the operable shutters that people have, mm -hmm. um, they're not designed for high impact. Right. They, they may, they provide some protection if something kind of lightweight, you know, is blowing in the wind. So they help to protect your windows, mm -hmm. but, but the impact rated ones are designed where you could get a two by four going 35 miles per hour, hitting right. the glass and, and, or hitting that, that, that shutter and it won't penetrate. So just normal operable wood shutters are right. beautiful and they give a little bit of protection, but they're not as, as robust and right. not the same as those that are rated. They usually right. have a metal component in them. Yeah, and I was about to say there's a brand, I can't remember the exact brand, but they were trying to mimic the look of those wood shutters. And mm -hmm. I know recently the Historic District Landmarks Commission in New Orleans had reviewed to kind of see if it would be something that they would they would be okay with because we do have to consider you know Absolutely. new materials all the time and and protecting those openings and buildings as much as we can and and people I mean I think there's new products out there that really don't affect the look of the building as much but really give you that same protection or that right. strong, stronger protection. Yeah, the, the impact screening I think that is removable is a great option because it fits the removable criteria. And then the, the removable corrugated panels, you know, the right. left hand translucent panels, because the yeah. only thing installed is, is a little track at the top and the bottom. So I'm hoping that, you know, the historical mm -hmm. society can be okay with that. Yeah, I think what we've done in the past when I was working with that, um, with HDLC was just painting out the track. A lot of people will even remove the track during non-storm season mm -hmm. and they'll just put the track back up. But those tracks kind of disappear once they're kind of placed on the oh, building, absolutely. painted out, Paint and you really back. don't, 
don't see it. You'll see it a lot downtown. You'll notice them if you're really looking for it, but um, otherwise they kind of disappear once they're painted out. And we had, um, I think there was one other question here about the shutters. Um, does a temporary wind resistant shutter listed as cheaper, or easier to store option need PRC approval or is a hardware not visible? Oh, so this is kind of like we were talking about. So I think yeah. it's more of a HDLC, the guideline restriction. So I'll, I'll say that you definitely wanna always make sure with the historic districts, if you're in a historic district that's regulated, make sure with your local entity and see what they require. There's usually guidelines available online. But if you wanna go, if you wanna to touch on that, Claudette, please. Um, well, you know, I can't really speak for them and what their criteria is because it, it varies. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I would assume it'd be a matter of showing them you know the track and and that when it's painted and it's just right above the window like you said it it kind of disappears and um and so if they can be acceptable with that the rest of it is you know you only put it up before the storm and it right. will protect that historic home mm -hmm. you know which seems like it should have some you know factor to consider there. And so something that will really protect the home from, from windborne debris, you know, that I would hope that they would consider that as long as everything there is, you know, doesn't detract from the beauty and, you know, and the historic nature and, and it, it's also reversible. Yeah, for the, H, the, at least the local New Orleans historic districts, there is a whole chapter on resiliency and they're open to options, but they, but it's really just important to get it reviewed, get it approved before yeah. you go out and spend or install anything. I, I know that there have been times that people spend thousands of dollars on a new product and then have to go back and return or oh. you know remove it. <laughs> yeah. So it's just important to always go yeah, through that yeah, entity, especially if you're invest. in a protected, yeah, exactly, historic yeah, district. But but and, the review is is worth them. the worth the money at the end of the you know, you'll get the protection you get, you need with getting the right, the right review. So let's see here. So someone had asked actually what the tr the translucent removable shutters were made of. Well, there's, um, you know, they can, some of them are made out, you know, like the, the solid ones are made out of aluminum, but the translucent ones are made out of, um, I guess the brand name is Lexon. It's, it's a, mm -hmm. I think it's a polycarbonate that, that, um, that is very impact resistant, you know, very, very strong, but super lightweight. And, um, and so it's not, a, you know, it's not the same kind of plastic you would find and, you know, other kinds of plastics. It's, it's a, I believe it's polycarbonate or, or, yeah. or something along those lines. But don't hold me to that because I'm really not, you know, a chemist or the material <laughs> expert there. But, but if they are, if they meet the standard, that's the thing. It's if you get a translucent or a corrugated panel, be sure that it's impact tested and rated. So if it if it meets the ASTM impact rated standard, then you know it it it'll be strong enough to take that 35 mile per hour stud and not break. Right. Um, so there's kind of two questions here. I think for more either affordable options for storm preparation or if, if you have any tips for renters, but so for residents that are not able to make structural architectural changes, but looking to be proactive or any tips that you have for something under $500 to help prevent flooding. Do you have any quick tips for 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 temporary homeowners or renters that could maybe- Well, you know, that, that's kind of the thing I was saying with the with a wet flood proofing or, or flood hardy concept, it's not all or nothing, whatever you can afford to do, do. So if you can put, um, just elevate your water heater on a platform um, or elevate your air conditioner compressor on a platform, then that's not you know, a very expensive thing to do. Um, in, in terms of, of wind, the old thing of taping, you know, putting masking tape across your windows, that does not do anything. So that is a waste of time and effort and money. Um, and, and so, you know, do not waste effort doing that. But, but removing things that be can become flying debris all around your home is a free thing to do. Um, you know, getting your, your limbs trimmed. And then the caulking 
tips that I provided, mm -hmm. particularly fastening your soffit vents, you know, with, with screws and with, um, you know, with a sealant and then caulking penetrations to reduce um, the water coming in from wind driven rain. Those are things that even a renter could do as well. Um, uh, if you have gable end vents like many do, you might want to cover those if you can before the hurricane and just take it back down. To it's get funny water. that you mentioned that because one of the questions we have is, should you keep the windows in your attic open a crack for ventilation? <laughs> close, close. <laughs> so keep them closed. Uh, an open window increases your hazard. So keep them closed. I'm just looking through one last time. I think we really touched on all of the questions due to like storm prep and wind and resiliency. Um, there were a couple questions from like a new homeowner's perspective of maybe what they should be looking for when looking at a property. If there's anything, if you had some tips for that, what people should really be kind of looking out for when they're looking at a home to buy. Well, you know, I suggested the hip roof, you know, it's just kind of inherently more, more aerodynamic, but, but the number one thing to, to inquire about is, is the roofing. That's mm -hmm. where, the, that's the biggest source of damage and loss. And, um, you know, and try and find information about what kind of roofing was installed. You know, in most parts of the state, if you don't specify, you know, wind rated, um, class H, you can just assume that it's not going to be. But in New Orleans, you know, you, you may find a, in the whole New Orleans area, you may find a little bit more of, of the wind tested, wind rated roofing. And go up and look at it and see if the nails are, are overdriven in the shingles. And see right. if they have that starter strip under the first course, you know, where the, the first course of shingle is really glued to a starter strip which is attached to the roof. So those are some telltale signs if they use, um, you know, a wind rated roofing or not. And, and so that, that, you know, that's a real biggie. In a new home in your area, um, some of the homes may have impact rated windows where they don't need exterior shutters. It's actually less expensive um, oftentimes to get an impact rated window than to get impact rated shutters. Because mm -hmm. for the shutters to look good, they get really, you know, and work, they get expensive. So, you know, look for those kinds of things. But really, the, the biggest is the roof. And then whatever can be um, the roofing, the shape of the roof, and, and the protection from, from water being driven in to cracks and gaps and penetrations in the walls. And sealing those penetrations might also help a little bit with, you know, reducing air leakage and, and helping, um, helping some energy efficiency. The other thing I would say is don't pick a house that's got vinyl wallpaper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have it, get rid of it, you know, like a renter or, you know, or someone else, get rid of that vinyl wallpaper and, and just use latex paint. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. I think this is extremely helpful and so timely right now as we get into storm season and- uh, Absolutely. I mean, fingers are crossed. We don't right. get Sammy this year. Uh, you know, last year was something else with the number of storms. So it's, right. um, you know, we're, we're all kind of gun shy and, and I hope we remain gun shy and don't become complacent like we used to be. So I commend right. everyone who, who tuned in today, um, you know, to learn how to, uh, some good ways to to make their their beautiful historic homes uh, continue to last and to make it to where after an event they can go back in those homes very quickly. Yes, I think it's important to take that time now to be prepared and be safe. So Absolutely. I appreciate everyone for tuning in and thank you again, Dr. Claudette, for joining us and everybody have a good night. Thank you. Good night. All right. Thank you.